Okay. Okay. So found buttonholes and welt pockets really elevate your garment. They really do. You kind of look at garments that have found buttonholes and think, oh wow, that's a really nice garment. Um because they take a lot a little extra work. I mean, it's not as easy as just pushing a program button on the sewing machine, which I don't get me wrong, I love being able to do that. <laughs> but um the two of them are very similar. And really, all you're doing is you're taking a piece of fabric, you're stitching either two lines or a square, and then flipping it to the inside. And we've all done that before. But there's a lot of little tricks, and there's a lot of steps. And so if you can get all those steps and those little tricks mastered, it's really pretty easy to do. Um, so because these things are all the same, there's a couple of things you always want to do. You always want to interface, usable interface the back, from the back, on the, the front of your garment where you're going to apply these pieces. You always want to interface your welts unless you're doing them on the bias and you need it on the bias to curve because you can do curved bound uh, double welt pockets. And so if you're going to do a curve, you need the welt to be able to curve, and that's a bias piece. Um, you really only need on your garment to mark the two ends, straight line and the two ends. And that's really all you need to do. So if you've got that marked, you are set to go. Um, the trick I have found that has made making these to me easy to do is real learning from Kenneth to reduce your stitch length. So when you start sewing a, but, a bound buttonhole or a welt pocket in the corners, you want your stitch length to be about 0.5. That's incredibly small, right? So you do a 0.5, you can go a little ways, Increase it to a 0.9. In the middle, do a 1.5, 0.9, and a 0.5. So you want incredibly small stitches. Do not back stitch. There's a couple reasons why, which I'll get into. Remind me, but um, that will help you. When you're doing that 0.5, you don't need to back stitch because it is basically kind of each stitch is locking in place. And that's helping it not to fray because you've done that very small stitching. Okay, so keep those things in mind as we go through this. There's a couple different ways of doing them. All of them are great. They each have their different purpose as it relates to what the garment is or what the fabric is that you're using. If it's lightweight, if it's wool, you know, if it steams well, if it's a natural fiber. And so that can influence the way you do it. But one of the easiest ways to do it is with the one piece method. And this is for a bound buttonhole or a welt pocket application. This is the right side of your fabric. And this is the wrong side. On the wrong side, you've applied your fusible. I hope this makes sense your fusible interfacing. Apply it in a circle and pink the edges. But when you pink the edges and you have curved edges and you fuse it to a garment, it doesn't show through to the opposite side. You don't see this rigid line for where the fusible changes the drape of the fabric, okay? So these pants, this is a very thin um, quill, but when you go to look at where the um, fusible is, you don't really see the fusible. You don't see it showing through where the fusible ends or begins. And that's because you've applied it with a pinked edge and in a circle, so curved edges, okay? So you'll always do that, is apply that fusible, okay? So this is the one side, the one piece method. 
this piece here, you're going to cut, and I have the formula down there. This is the lips fabric, and I purposely made this a different fabric that had a print on it, just so you could tell the right side from the wrong side, okay? So the, the lips fabric, you're going to cut the length of the lips fabric one inch wider than the length of the opening, okay? On either side, so two inches longer, one inch on each side, so you have some fabric. So to manipulate and play around with. And then your lip is the distance from the center line to the stitching. That's what we call the distance of the lip. So from the center line, from the center line to the edge of the stitch. So it's that times, uh, what did I say here? 12. Because we're gonna do a lot of folding. So, just bear with me here. So you're going to apply the right side of the welt fabric and you would have fusible on here as well, okay? I don't wanna, it's easier for me not to have that now. Put this on top and now you're gonna stitch and you're gonna stitch with a 0.5 stitch length coming out to here. 0.9 stitch length, 1.5, 0.9, and then 0.5. Pivot, turn, and do the same. And you can keep this as a 0.5 going all the way up or a 0.9 going all the way up and a 0.5 in your corners, okay? So you're gonna get this stitch. And when you overlap at the end, do not back stitch, okay? So it'll be locked in. Now we're going to cut. And this is the nervous part. This was the nervous part for me until I realized I can't rip out 0.5 stitch length. So there's no need to be nervous with the cutting because you've already committed <laughs> the uh, hard part. You've finished the hard part. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut on the cutting line down the center to the Y's at the end. Okay, and this can be a little nerve wracking, I guess, but it really shouldn't be. The real crux to this whole thing, and it doesn't matter how pretty your cutting is because my cutting is not pretty at all, um, is cutting into the corners. If you do not cut far enough into those corners, that is what's going to ruin or make your pockets look homemade or not well done is because you haven't cut far enough into the corners, okay? So you cut all the way up to the cutting line, but not through it, okay? So here's where, this is why I'm gonna tell you don't backstitch. One of the reasons why. When you are doing this, you are working with color matching thread. So if I'm working on a black garment, I'm gonna be using black thread. If I'm white, whatever. It is really, really difficult to see black on black. And so if you have kept your thread tails long like this, and you have not backstitched, you can see the thread tails. You can hold a thread tail and you can aim for that thread tail and see where the end of the line is. And that makes it a heck of a lot easier. So that's just one reason to keep those thread tails long. Okay, but so what we've done is I've cut, and you can see I've cut into my corners through both sides of the fabric, okay? Now I'm going to take my fabric and we're going to push all this through to the other side. 
pull it through to the back. Now, it was a lot easier to manipulate this cardboard and make things bigger in order to demonstrate that it might not be as pretty in the end. But what I can do, and what I'm doing here is I'm folding it in and I'm folding on my stitching line, which would be just like pressing. So I pressed it all the way through and you can see, it's just like you would assume, you cut, you sewed a square, you cut it out and you turn it all to the inside, right? So this is your right side, this is the right side of your garment again, okay? And as I say, this is what you've got, right? Now, what makes this kind of cool is I'm going to take this fabric, this, this side of the lip, and I'm going to fold it down and then fold it back up to the halfway point of that opening. And now there's my first lip. Aha. Okay. Yep. And then I'm going to do the same on the other side, fold it up to meet the other fabric, fold it back down, and there's my two lips. And that's why it needs to be interfaced so it'll be crisp enough? Um, it'll be crisp enough, but also you're not gonna get um, spraying. It's gonna give you some stability for working with it, but you really want that. And when you're talking a bound buttonhole, it's gonna get a lot of wear and tear. So it's gonna give it a lot more strength. Same gotcha. thing goes for your pockets, which can really stretch out. Like we were talking about with the jackets where we put our hands in our pockets and we let them hang, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. and, and this can, there's nothing like having a pocket that, that hangs down because it's got no interfacing here to keep it with some body so that it has good wear and tear. So there we go, there is our first, uh, welt pocket. And this is the same technique for a bound buttonhole. So we have now formed this, right? Well, we're not done yet. Now what we need to do is we need to secure the ends. Okay. So here's our, our buttonhole or welt pocket in our, this is our one piece method. And securing the ends is something you're gonna do with every one of these techniques. From the wrong side, you're going to, okay, let's do it from this side. From the right side, fold back the fabric. And what you see here is a triangle. That was the part of the Y that you cut and you have your two lips. So there's my two lips, edges, and my triangle, okay? You see that? And now, using a zipper foot on your machine so that you can get right in there, you're going to stitch from here, straight up that stitching line onto the other side. And you can go back and forth over that a couple times, but you want to be right on that stitching line going from the bottom up and secure it here. So this is nicely tacked down. Okay, so now that's secured right there. And you're going to do the same thing on the other side. Of course, there's the other triangle and my two lips, and you're going to secure the ends on that side as well, okay? So now you have secured your ends and that is ready to go. That is your bound buttonhole or your double welt pocket. So that's what we have on this coat. 
all the way down the front. So you can see bound buttonholes all the way down the front. Okay, well, that's great because that was the front, but it's not the back. And now you got to do the back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you're making a garment, one of the very first things you do when making your coat is make the bound buttonholes. You make them on the front piece before you've basically done anything else. Okay. There's a couple of great things about that. And the way I tricked myself into doing it was to buy enough fabric that I knew if I screwed up, I could recut the front and do it some other way. But it was a way to build my confidence in what I was doing, is to have enough extra fabric I knew I could recover, <laughs> okay? So you've now done, if you've now done the fronts of your buttonholes, you're set. You know your garment's gonna be perfect. You can finish the whole construction and you don't have to worry about a thing because the hard part's done. What you are now gonna do is you're gonna wait until you've applied your facing. And when you have applied your facing, so this piece here would be solid and it's gonna fold back. And what you're gonna do is from the front side, you're gonna take pins and you're gonna put a pin in each of the corners. You can do it in corners or just uh, along the edge of the lips. And once you put those pins in, you know exactly where on the back you are going to be, okay? Now, so here's, here's two samples. Let's see where to play with. Um, take your silk organza, okay? and lay your silk organza on the back side of this interfacing. I don't think I have a sample here right now. And when you put the, the silk organza on the back side, you can now stitch this square and flip it inside out like we just did with this sample. Treat, treat the silk organza as this piece. Linda, you're making a box again, right? I'm sorry? You're making a box out of the facing with the silk organza. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. So take this is now your silk organza. You had marked where the corners of the um, bound buttonhole were. Stitch your square, flip it all to the inside, just like you did with the front. And now this square will line up perfectly with the back of the bound buttonhole. And then you just slip stitch it in place. Okay. So remember the coat, the pieces that I had last month, the inside okay. of this coat. This is the coat that I'm making for my, my daughter-in-law. And on the collar here, you can see, put a bound buttonhole. And on the inside, it looks the same because I used the silk organza and I just duplicated the square and then slip stitched it in place. So this is the coat that I was making last month that you all saw in pieces. And all the rest of the buttonholes are in the middle in this concealed button flap. But this one needed to be front and center. And you know, you're gonna be wearing this open half the time, right? So you're going to see this. So it had to look good. And so what I did is the whole coat, 
I put the bun, bound buttonhole in the collar before it ever went on to the coat. So it was just this little piece of fabric here, put it in. And then when I went to apply the facing, I had it lined up, I stitched the top here. I could flip it down on the inside, mark with pins from the front where it lined up, put my silk organza on the back side and stitch my window and then slip stitch it in place. Okay, so funny story. I showed my son the coat, he came over and I showed him the coat. He was like, oh, Emily will be so excited. And I showed him the inside. I'm like, Brian, see, this matches the silk scarf I made her. And there's her monogram. I put a little pocket here so she could put her scarf. He said, that's all well and good, mom, but that's not her monogram. She dropped her last name and kept her middle name. So her middle initial is not her last name initial. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, holy smokes. <laughs> oh, what are you gonna do? I'd have her change her name. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Yep. But so this was part of my show and tell from this month as I finished up this jacket. <laughs> And then this is the wool coat that you'd seen before. It had no lining, so it got its lining. And that's my show and tell also for this month. But this again, this is the um, double weld pocket. Now, here's one of the things is, is make it a different color, which is really lovely and it, it's nice. Now, let's talk about the pocket bag, making a pocket bag for the pocket, okay? When you see through here, what do you want to see? Here, I want to see black, okay? One of the first coats I made, I did this lovely coat. I wear this all the time, actually. But what do you see? Purple. Oh, nice yeah. Nice little pop of color. Yeah. But not really where you're going. Right. What you need is a facing at the top of your pocket bag. So if this piece here, the back of the pocket had had a facing to it, I wouldn't have had this issue. But boy, I don't like that. But this is why you apply a pocket facing. So. Uh. Linda, is there any reason why you can't just make the pocket out of the front fabric? Oh, you, um, it depends on what you're making it out of. If I was doing the pocket bag out of this, it would be really bulky, okay. you know, because you'd be adding two to three more layers yeah. of this heavy tweed, right? I gotcha. Um, this one, remember, I used the Kashi uh, interfacing, which is a satin backed flannel. So it's really, really warm. So I put that in the pockets and it's gonna make the pockets really warm for your hands. So um, that would be you know, one of the reasons. I mean, if, if you were making it out of something else that you'd liked, I mean. We would have like if it were like gabardine or something. I'm sorry? About like gabardine. Would yeah. that be too thick or? It might be. Um, I personally, I love the feel of the Bemberg or the Silk mm -hmm. Charmeuse. In this one I made, this is Silk Charmeuse. And boy, mm -hmm. I love the feel of that on the inside. However, okay, so here's my Silk Charmeuse that I did. Yeah. For the, mm -hmm. for the up chest pocket, I've forgotten, I, I sewed it on the wrong way. So the shiny soft side of the upper welt pocket bag is inverted. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if I can put my hands in there. So not a, not a worry. <laughs> um, but you're right. I mean, pockets get a lot of wear and tear. 
And that's part of the hard part. So they tend to give out. Um, in men's dress pants, the, uh, there's a special fabric pocket facing, pocketing. And it tends to be stronger, but it's thin and it's uh, a, like a lightweight, <laughs> not even a cotton. But I gotta say, in these pants, I thought I'd be okay using this quilting cotton. It's really pretty stiff and pretty mm. thick compared to regular pocketing in men's pants. And it's done a couple of techniques that I haven't liked because it has added bulk to it. And you really kind of want to think about making sure that you reduce bulk. And bulk is the real issue with these things because you are getting into a lot of folds mm -hmm. in here. And you want those folds to kind of disappear. You don't want them to stand out and be too obvious. Um, Kenneth King has a technique um, with his bound buttonholes where he puts an extra layer in the middle of that with a grow grain ribbon. So now you've added that grow grain ribbon in there as well. It gives you confidence in the size of your welts as you're making it, your lips. But I found in the end, I didn't like it as much because of the bulk that it added. I liked removing the bulk and feeling like this was a lot thinner, you know. Okay, pocket bags. Where's my symbol? Okay, here's one. We'll do this. Okay. So here is a double weld pocket. Okay. Okay. So there we've got that. And what we're going to do, oh, I seem to be missing a couple pieces. No, okay. I'll tell you what, we're gonna skip pocket bags until we get to the end. We did the single one piece bound button hole and uh, well, double well pocket. Now we're going to do the two piece method. And the two piece method uses two lips. So here's one right here, the other. And so you've merely cut two pieces of fabric and interface them. And then basted along the stitching line. And now you have and then, you know, uh, trim them up so that if my welt is going to be a total of one inch wide, that means my lips are each half an inch, right? So these cut lips have to be a half inch, half inch, a half inch, and a half inch, two inches wide. Linda, where's the fold on the lips? Is it on the top or the bottom? It's on the, the top. Yeah, it's on, the, on top. the top. And the middles are cut, right? Your cut edges yes. are lined up to your center. The center line. The center okay. line. Of the box. Yeah, okay. all I have here is a mark of the center line and the end. And that's all I needed to have on the right side was the mark of the center line and the end. My lips are then precisely cut to be four times the width of the lip and the length of the lips plus two inches. Okay. Then I lay, I lay these down such that the cut edges line up to the center line. And again, I'm going to stitch at 0.5 at the start, 0 0.9, 1.5, 0 0.9, and 0.5. Again, no back stitching. 
and leave your thread tails long. Because when I go to stitch on the other side, so once you've gotten the one in, now you have to go make an exact match straight along that edge because you want a straight edge. You don't want it to be wonky like this. You want it to be straight. What you do is you take this thread tail from this side and you pull it straight across 90 degrees. Now put your fabric under the machine and you can position your needle starting exactly where that thread tail is on your stitching line. And you did that because you pulled the thread tail across 90 degrees and you just hold it and then stick your needle right in, right where it is. Now start stitching at your 0.5, your 0.9, your 1.5, your 0.9, and your 0.5. And when you get to the bottom, you're gonna do the same thing. Grab the thread tail, pull it across 90 degrees, and you will know exactly where to stop. And that way you have matched it up perfectly. Okay? So that is one of the best reasons not to cut your thread tails on this one. <laughs> so now, again, this is what it looks like from the wrong side. Because we stitched this on the right side and you can see we have our interfacing. And remember, if you're doing this black on black and then you have black interfacing and then black thread, it's hard to see all this. At least my old eyes don't see it all as well. And so having that thread tail makes it so much easier for me to see things. So now we are going to cut again ah, down the center line. almost to the end. Now I'm gonna come in here. I don't have to cut the lips. What I do is I cut the garment fabric. So I'm coming through with the garment fabric here, but not the lip here. And I can see where that thread tail is. And because you have not backstitched, if you backstitched, the thread tail will not be at the very end. So having the thread tail at the very end, you know you are going to get to the very end when you're doing your cutting. And your cutting is the most precise thing. So this is where you're going in and you are cutting right to that point, but not through it, okay? Same thing on the other side. And as you see, it doesn't matter how pretty these cuts are, and they can be very difficult to get precise when you're going through a lot of thicknesses. There we go. And now we're gonna do the same thing. We are going to flip it all to the inside. One way to do this is take your lips, match them to the end, Stick them through and grab them. And they come in. It's hard to manipulate the cardboard. And so what did you call this technique, Linda? This is the uh, two piece. Okay. This is the two piece method. Okay. So there you go. We've got the two welts. They meet in the center because you stitch them that way. You measured precisely and you've got them in there just the way you want them. You flipped them and you've used two pieces 
And again, you're now gonna have to secure the ends where you fold back the front side and you see the two lips and you see the triangle. And now you're gonna secure using your zipper foot on your machine by stitching from the top down that stitching line straight. To, and there's not a stitching line here now because you can stitch across the end, but you're gonna stitch right across. Get that point right there and get that point right there and make sure that you have stitched those down, okay? And so that's how you're gonna secure your ends down here. Linda, is there a reason why you would choose this method over the other method? Is there an advantage to this method? No. No, okay. Because it, it seems harder to me actually, but. Um. Let me think. I guess, well, this might be a little less bulky. Okay. And the reason why is because here you have each lip is two thicknesses and your triangle is one thickness. Uh, okay. I and a physically smaller piece that you've used for the welts too. So maybe that's another advantage. Okay. Say that again. Um, with the, the one that you started where it's one big piece for uh -huh. the belt, you have a much larger piece that you have to start out with. Yes. So you're, you're using less fabric, I guess, with the second method too. What? Mm, I, don't, I don't know. Pieces, that, smaller Well, pieces. here you're going to have each of the welts. So uh, oh, you yeah, have... Yeah, yeah. And the two corner. pieces here and mm. two pieces here, but you have this extra layer that's right, right there plus yeah. the triangle. So you have one extra layer of fabric. Mm. I had tried, um, so I had a, a bow fur pony type fabric mm. and I wanted to have black leather look. It was pleather. And so I used double welts and the two welts instead of a single one because it would have been too bulky to turn a big piece of leather fabric yeah. when all I really wanted was the lip edges to be that black. Ultimately, it did not work. It was a water. I ended up, <laughs> <laughs> but you learn these things. Yeah. Um, when you're dealing with a thicker fabric, something that's not going to manipulate as easily, the double welt process, yeah. the two piece is going to be a little easier yep. because you have just that less uh, bulk to it. Okay. Mm. So the, uh, this coat that we did with Kenneth King, this was the single, the one piece bound buttonhole method. Okay. So you have that one extra layer and this is a really heavy wool. So it adds that just that little bit extra amount. And so when you start getting into your, your seams, it gets a little bit bulkier. Okay. And then there's even another technique that's even more advanced, but it's a lot harder um to do precisely that reduces the bulk as well but yes oh yes oh oh i didn't yeah it's on the back oh right. it is yeah yeah so make sure that you've done your interfacing because you know then you also feel like oh it's not going to shred and it's going to have the strength to stand up to the wear and tear that pockets get okay um, one of the things with the one piece method is remember we did this folding, right? And we folded and we created our welts with these folds. You can do your men's pants pockets this way, okay? So you have folded up one side.
So we have, we come back to, this is the inside. We stitched our square and here's the, uh, now you're seeing the right side. Take this weld and fold it the entire length oh. of the square. And now mm -hmm. there's your weld. And this is what you'll see, especially on the on your back pockets. So your men's pocket. This is also the uh, closet core, uh, the Sasha trousers. And there you can see. And this is that single welt method. And you just fold it such that you have the whole weld coming up from the bottom, okay? A lot of times what you will see, especially on men's, because you know they're in and out of their back pockets all the time, right? Yep. From here to here, it'll be zigzagged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or they might also have little stitching that comes out on the ends, whether it's a, a half moon or a triangle mm -hmm. or something. And you'll see that, and a lot of um, makers will use that as a tell that that's a garment they made. Oh. Now, this is something else to go. Yep. You know what? If my corners aren't perfect, I'll just do a zigzag on the ends. I can cover up those corners. I can do that. It'll look just fine. And then it'll look like I made it that way. Now, when you're doing that, and especially when you're doing your men's, one of the things you have to consider is when you put the buttonhole in, mm. okay? So you wanna put that buttonhole in before you've closed off the, butt, the uh, pocket bag. Yeah. Because it's hard to sew a buttonhole in here now. Oh, How do yes. I get this in my machine to get a buttonhole done, right? So once you've done the weld, then you sew the buttonhole and then you go. Okay, so this is another one where you see there's the back, fa the pocket facing at the top and there's the pocket bag fabric on the inside. Okay, so, uh, so we did the two pocket, the two piece method, okay. Now, let's talk about wealth pockets exclusively. So one of the things with your wealth pockets is you got to make, uh, sometimes you want to have a flat for your pockets. So you want to make a pocket wealth that is the large kind that you're gonna put in your coat, like so, right? So you make these up. Now these should be one eighth of an inch, one eighth of an inch longer than your pocket opening. Okay, so it's gonna have a little bit that you're gonna steam into place because when you put this flap in, you want it to fill from here all the way to here. You don't want it to end here. <laughs> That's going to make it look a little bit off if you don't end it properly. Okay. So you can make your pocket flap, make your double welt pocket, and then all you have to do is like this, and I did not do this precisely, so I don't know if it'll match. Stick it up in. And now there's my, whoop, that flap. It's a little longer, so you can actually see it. And it would go in, okay? Now, what you're gonna do is from the back side, you're gonna insert it. And now 
you're going to fold it down and you are just going to stitch right along that stitch line that you already had because you've stitched right on that stitch line it is going to perfectly line up okay so at this point that's when you need to start getting into your pocket bags there's there's two pieces that go to your pocket bags. There is the piece that is closest to the body. And then there's the piece that is the outermost from the body. Okay, so this is the top. The top is the one that's the outermost from the body. And the back or the bottom is the one that's closest to the body. And on that piece, you want to put a facing so that when you look into the pocket, you see the same fabric. You don't want to see a purple lining on a blue coat because you did not put that facing there, right? So when you sew that facing on, just zigzag the end, leave it raw, leave it one layer, this Vogue pattern for the men's pants had you fold it in half and zigzag it. And it's like, it's just one more layer. It had, it became more bulky. I did not like that at all. Just stitch it down. And you, so all you're doing is you're stitching it on both sides. There's, so that is this piece here. And what you can see is I've just zigzagged it down on the pocket bag. So we had our welt. Here's another welt in gray. And here what I did is I faced this welt with the lining. And that way it's just a little bit thinner. Same thing with the linen jacket inside of the flap is the lining. It makes it just that little bit thinner and nicer. It's not so bulky. And when it's bulky, it's gonna give it stiffness, which might make it also stand out a little bit. So it's better if it's, you know, more drapey. Okay, so for this application, same thing. You applied your interfacing to the back. You have your welt lined up, all you did was mark your center line and your two ends, and that's all you had to mark. You've taken your bottom welt, lined it up to the center line. You've taken your bottom pocket facing, so it's the side that will be closest to the body, that has the pocket facing and the rest of the pocket bag. You've lined it up to the center, and again, You've stitched those two lines. You want to be very precise here when it comes to stitching this welt because we want it to end right there. So what I do is I, I roll my needle down till my needle is standing right there, just off the edge. Then I push my garment in to the point where the welt pocket lines up to the needle. And then I place the needle down. So it is right on the edge. My first stitch will be into the pocket well. And stitch this line first. You want to stitch this line. This one can vary, but this one can't. You start here and it has size. And then you stop exactly at the end. The last stitch is right at the end. Okay? Again. Leave your thread tails long. And now you can pull it over 90 degrees. And you can start precisely at that point. Stitch all the way to the end with the long thread tail. Pull it over, line it up, and stop precisely at the end. Okay. Now, again, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to cut and we're going to cut right to our edges, right to our corners. And I can see 
right to that point, right where the thread tail is. And now when I flip, oh, did I screw this up? I think I screwed, no, I didn't. I got it. As I say, these get very confusing. So I have flipped the back pocket all the way through. I have my little Y's right here. And I flip this up, but from the front, now I have the top of my pocket well inside. There's the back of my pocket. On the back side, here's the back of my pocket. Here's my triangles. And my welt standing up on the front and the seam is pressed down on the back. Now I'm going to take the top pocket bag And I'm going to line it up such that the ends line up with the cut edge of that pocket. I'm going to stitch right on top of the stitching line, right there. I'm gonna use pins to simulate that. And when it's done, it will flop down. The top pocket bag will flip down. I have the same thing from the front. There's my pocket well. You can see the inside of my pocket. There's the pocket facing. And here's my pocket bag, the front and the back. And so all you're going to do now. you have this all lined up, right? Fold back. And here you go. You've got your triangle and your pocket bag. And now you're going to stitch the triangle all the way down around your pocket bag, back up and on the other side. Or just secure these first and then go do your pocket bag. And it doesn't matter if these don't line up precisely. Trim them off, stitch it and then trim it. Who cares? It's on the inside. You're never gonna see it. Okay, now, sometimes what you will have is like this one where your pocket is on an angle. Okay, so what we have here, is our pocket bag on an angle. On the inside, the pocket bags look like this. They're shaped. They have this kind of right angle. They go so your hand can go in and down. You're going to just line it up, stitch that pocket bag all the way around. And then remember, you want to put in a pocket stay. Because if you don't, put that pocket stay in, this pocket is just gonna hang down like this. And it's never gonna be comfortable in your coat. You're always gonna struggle to get your hand in initially. So make sure that after you have done that, 
you have your pocket stay. The pocket stay can be out of cotton. It can be out of uh, silk organza <laughs> and stitch it just to, into the seam line and to a securing seam. So that seam, a stable seam, it could be the side seam, it could be up into the armhole. If you had some other designer seam somewhere, you could put it in, but typically it would be into the armhole or into the side, depending on where you need to put that, okay? But this one right here, it would be into the center front seam because this is the way the pocket would go, okay? So now that you've done the large welt, as we just did here, the only other thing you have to do is you have to slip stitch this welt to the front of the garment. You just slip stitch it up and have it stand in place, okay? Now, what can happen is, if you're doing a thick fabric, like your coats, if you have done a square welt, it's square. Now you've seen this side and you've flipped it. You have four layers of fabric on the sides of that welt, which is really bulky. It is really bulky, okay? So what you wanna do, is the origami method of making a pocket weld. You can make your pocket welds in any shape you want to. We don't have any tape. Do we do some tape? Oh, yes. Thank you. Okay. We are going to. have a, a pocket welt that is shaped like so, okay? So it's not perfectly square. So what you wanna do is you wanna take the shape of the pocket welt, of the actual welt, no seam allowances included. And then you wanna take tape, and we are going to Tape closed those two ends. So remember, this was our welt. This was our opening. This was the folded edge. We're taping closed the two ends that would have been stitched. Okay, so remember, here we are. And we've just taped it closed. Now we're gonna take this piece. We're gonna take the back side of this well. And we're gonna cut from the cut edge to the corners. Now we're gonna open it up. This is your new pocket welt pattern. You're gonna trace this off and add seam allowances all the way around. Now, when you stitch it back together, your seams and the seam allowance are in the middle of the back weld. And of course, when you stitched it, you trimmed them, you cut your corners, and now they're flat and they're on the back of the welt and they're not on the two edges, giving you all that bulk on the two edges. So you have a much flatter, a smooth welt to go on your jacket. Like dark, dark rearrangement. Yeah. 
but you can do this and you can make any shape you want. I mean, like the parentheses look, you know, cowboy look, you can make a welt in a cowboy look. Now for that, maybe what you do is you line it with um, your pocket line on the back side, something like that. Okay, so we went over this a little bit. I just did a silver ganza lecture. So that's why I keep emphasizing silver ganza. I think it's a great thing for the sewing room. If you have a garment that has a pattern, what you want is pockets that you can't see. Where's that pocket? There it is. You want pockets that just blend in and you never even know that you have a pocket there. So how do I make that weld? You can see there's the weld. Match in the pocket. What I do is I take my garment, the front, and you're gonna have to do it for each side. Lay it out. Take your silk organza, lay it on top of the pattern. You can, you can uh, trace out, here's a sample. And what I have done is I've basted in a color where that pocket would be. You see the basting right there. Now I take my silk organza, and I lay it right on top of exactly where that is. And I use a pencil and I trace the pattern of what's on the fabric onto the silk organza. Now I take this piece of silk organza and I go back to the fabric that I'm going to be cutting out of my scrap where I'm gonna cut my welt out of. And I line this up. And what I do is I take, not the right side, and I always label it with an R. As you can tell, an R, right side, wrong side. If it doesn't read, it's wrong. Take the R and put it on the reverse side. Line it up to the reverse side of the fabric. Find where the pattern matches up. So look all over and finally get that matched up exactly where you want it. Baste it in place. Now you've got it exactly basted and you know you've got exactly the right thing because the right side of the organza is going to be laid out to the right side of the fabric. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you baste it in place. Now that it's basted in place, you can cut out that pocket weld. You can stitch it, leave the silk organza in there because it's gonna be a stabilizer and it's got no thickness, but it perfectly lays out. And now you have pocket welds that perfectly line up and you match up all your, your uh, flowers and everything. And again, there's the pocket facing. Always do pocket facing. You learn something from um, hard luck and you'll always remember it. <laughs> so, okay, we went over just about everything, I think. Is there anything? that we're missing. Mm -hmm. Any questions y'all have? Okay, so think about when you're doing your, your um, welts, be, get creative, like do stripes and cut your stripes on a bias. Mm -hmm. So now you have angled welts, do them like going out or <laughs> going one direction or the other, do plaids, do them that way. Do a curve and use your use bias. Do the two method, the two piece method. Cut on the bias so that they will curve. The thinner you make them, the easier they'll be, right? So you do a pretty narrow bias lip. 
and it can go right on that curve. You can flip it and you'll have these two perfect curves. Okay. So the only other thing is really fun. You can make your wilt pockets out of any shape, really. Yep. So that's just, awesome. <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> and all I did for this, all I did was basically uh, cut my shape, trace my shape onto uh, lining, could have been silk or ganza, stitch the outline, turn it so I had a window, and then I made two large welts to just go on the back. And I, I think that would be fun yes. to have as a pocket. Yep. I mean, that would really... Or if you had a patterned fabric, you know, like that one, to, to emphasize, you know, some sort of floral aspect, you could do that, um, some sort of sweep of the floral right. as, the, as the well. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You could <coughs> have the chest make it a little smaller, maybe the chest. Yeah. <laughs> for breast cancer. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so. The only other thing I would say is like, um, like when you're doing your pocket welts for the jacket, here what I've done is I've, I have used weft interfacing and I've applied it basically to silk organza. And then this is what I will use to create my weft, my uh, welt for a coat, just to give it more strength and stability so that when this coat gets worn all the time, this welt here is super strong. I don't want this to stretch out. I don't want this to over time be, be hanging because it's gotten so much wear. I want this to be really nice and solid. And all it is, is here, this is just slip stitched in place. So, I think that just about covers it. As I say, once you have stitched this in place with that 0.5, you're not ripping that out. That's mm -hmm. too hard. Just try it one time and you'll say never again. Mm -hmm. So once you've done your stitching, it's all over. Everything else is easy. <laughs> Linda, watching you is like watching the Olympics. You make it look easy and you make me think I can do it. <laughs> You can, you can, trust me. <laughs> Thank you so much, it was great. You're welcome, thank you, thank you. And all I can say is, is you know, be sure to practice. I mean, I always practice every time with every one of them. I'm kind of surprised by how many I've done now. And everything came down to the 0.5 stitch length for me. That was the thing that made it easy. So just keep that in mind and you can do it. It's all straight line stitching and we can all stitch in a straight line, right, and Shannon? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so any other questions? So our, our next meeting will be Annette Young, who will be showing us how to bag a lining with sleeves. And then our December meeting is sort of like our capstone for this fall um, presentation series. And I know a lot of um, the members may not be sewing a jacket or a coat. Uh, and so the challenge would be for the December meeting is that you come prepared with some examples of techniques you've practiced as a result of this. And so practicing using sewing organza, maybe doing some pad stitching as far as some of the tailoring techniques, um, and then practicing your welts. And it's not necessarily that we're looking for perfection because we all know that doesn't come oh, no. straight out of the gate, but what we would like to know is what you have learned as a result of practicing these things that you can share with everybody else so that we can get some like
corporate learning going on because it's always more fun to learn from somebody else's mistakes than to make our own. Okay, can I add one more thing? Yes. That you brought my, made, triggered my memory. I wanted to say is if, when you're making your coats or your jackets and you're gonna put your bound buttonholes in, if you have hair canvas, cut it out where those buttonholes will be, okay? I don't know if you'll remember this jacket. I, I did hair canvas on the inside of this collar mm -hmm. so that the collar would always, you know, come close and hang close. So what I did is I knew where this buttonhole about was going to be because I had marked it on the pattern piece, right? So when I applied my hair canvas to the inner piece, I cut the hair canvas out with a generous margin. It doesn't have to be right up to it, but a generous margin. You are not going to be able to turn whether you're doing it here, if you've got weft or hair canvas, it's just a little bit too tough. And, and it's gonna uh, be bulky, add more bulk to that area. So you wanna use a knit interfacing in that knit fusible interfacing where you're doing this. And then you can do weft around the edge or hair canvas around the edge, but you don't want it right where that is or right in this area. Okay, make it easier on yourself that way. Don't do it because especially the hair canvas, it's not gonna turn. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh -huh. So what, I'm, what I am taking away from all of this stuff is that sewing for here for a jacket or a coat is really a very small percentage of the actual sewing. The vast, the vast amount of work for sewing a coat or a jacket comes in the thinking ahead, the planning and the preparation. And the pressing. So, and the pressing. Pressing, 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 pressing. So, all right. If there is nothing else, I will go ahead and close out the recording. And uh, I thank you guys all for coming, for waking up early and um, participating. And welcome to Shannon for her first meeting. I hope she's not scared by us and comes back. All right. Take care. Putting this together. Thank you so much. Oh, yes. See you guys. Nice. Stop Fantastic. Good. Yes. <laughs>